So may maybe you actually want to start us. Um, the opposite category. Uh huh. So um, categories like police officers travel in pairs. Um, uh, and yeah, every every category has what we call its opposite category. But it doesn't get worse than that. The opposite of the opposite is the category you first thought of. But so, um, so what is it? Um, well, the idea is that the objects of OPSI, or CEOP, is it's more often called. But we're writing OPC because OP looks like an ordinary operator. So, uh, are the same as the objects of C. Uh, but now I have to say uh, what the morphisms are. And these are the things that go in the other direction. So, the opposite direction. Yes. Oh, what has happened? Oh, I haven't reloaded. So you see, um, we're, uh, what we're flipping around is the homomorphism. Uh, there's nothing magical here. Uh, C-op morphisms from S to T are just another a long-winded way of saying C morphisms from T to S. Um, this construction is, however, sometimes rather useful. Um, so, um, uh, so you can see why if you take the opposite of the opposite, you get back where you started. Um, all right. So, uh, constructing the identity for each object is not uh, not any harder than it was before. So the identities are what they were, because a morphism from A to A and C op is a morphism from A to A and C. Shocking. Right. Composition. Uh, so what have I got to do? Someone's going to give me an F and a G. Uh, but uh, because they go the other way around, I'm going to have to use the composition in C that plugs them together in the opposite order. And again, choosing C was a bad, awkward. Okay, so um, when I do that, I get uh, a, a, an associativity obligation that is group the other way around from usual. So if I say asoc C um, uh, I've got um, I've got exactly the thing I don't want. But if I'm lucky will this be enough or will I have to do lots of noisy things? Oh that's cool. Um, so uh, Likewise, um, because composition is backwards, you should expect that left identity in the opposite category is given by right identity in the original. Uh, let's actually just get this. It certainly does. Good, because that saves me typing Unicode. And likewise, right identity in the opposite category is left identity in the original. So everything's back to front. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, well, we'll see where this comes up, yeah. I guess. I don't want to <laughs> jump the gun. No. Um, so it's a construction you can do. And as Connor says, it gives you twice as many categories as before, right? Because any category, you can just flip the arrows around. Um, and as a formal thing, not much is happening, right? But it means that we can now take a concept that makes sense in some category, and then we can say, OK, what does this mean in the opposite category? Right? And it often means something interesting or something different. Um, 
so we can start playing this game. Uh, what happens if I consider a functor from the opposite category of C to the opposite category of D? And I think we need to take this a bit slowly because it's, it's not completely obvious, I think. So what is a functor from op C to op D? So it's still a functor, right? So it's still going to turn objects into objects and morphisms into morphisms. So it's going to turn an object here into an object here. But the objects are actually the same as in the original category. So on objects we see no difference. We are turning objects of C into objects of D, just like before, right? If I had a functor from C to D. What about morphisms? Well, for every morphism from x to y here, I have to make a morphism from f of x to f of y here. Right? But this is again universally quantified over all the, ob all the morphisms from x to y. So that's in the original category is a morphism from y to x. Um, so we have to turn that into something from f of y to f of x in the original category, but then when you flip it around again, you get the same thing. So. Yeah. So x and y exchange roles, but the task is the same. Yeah. So, so that's it's same. basically the same thing as a functor. So if you think about uh, what functors do, right? Uh, so if you've got some uh, diagram illustrating uh, morphisms in C, uh, uh, some of which join together to make commuting triangles, uh, then a functor says you can translate that whole picture exactly as it is to a diagram that still makes the same sort of sense in D. Now, all the op construction does is it flips the direction of the arrows on the morphisms, leaving the picture exactly the same. So the task is still to preserve all the pictures just with the arrows pointing the other way. Um, so if you put an op on both sides here, then really nothing is happening. What can be interesting is to consider a functor from op C to D, for example, right? Because then we're only flipping the input arrows, but we're not flipping the output arrows. So on objects, it's still sending objects of C to objects of D. But now if I have a morphism from X to Y, then such a functor has to produce a flipped morphism from F of Y to F of X, right? So, uh, so such functors are different. And again, if I put the op on the input or the op on the output, that's the same thing again, right? Because it's just flipping. Um, so that can be interesting. But we can also consider going beyond functors and saying, OK, what is a monad if we restrict the categories of the form op C? Right? So if I look up the definition of monad. Yes. Okay, and then I'm going to consider what it means if, if I flip the arrows in C. So I'm going to call this a co-monad because everything is the other way around. Okay, so we just said that functors stay the same, but now my natural transformations here, if they are in op C, then they go the other way, right? So before they went from x to m of x, I'm going to change all of the m's to an upside down m, which is a w. Okay, and then I'm going to flip this arrow, so it goes the other way. And similarly here, before I went from m squared to m, now I'm going from w to w squared. So just flipping these directions. Um, okay, and then, so this, this is not really returning anything anymore, right? I'm not going from a pure thing into the monad, it's rather extracting something from, from this w. I go from w of x to x. This is usually called extract. And I'm not really joining anything together. I'm rather taking one thing and making two things. Right? So this is often called duplicate. Okay. Change all of the return to extract. 
I need to change all of the joints. The duplicate. No, I, the moment we're just playing a formal flip everything around and see what the definitions say game but don't worry some intuition will be along in a moment yeah so so the point i'm trying to make as well is that i can just use the fact that i have this notion of an opposite category to see if i get an interesting concept right and then we'll see that it will be an interesting concept okay so i changed the names of these things i flipped them around just still have these shortcuts for the actual transformations yeah um but then i also have to flip these compositions around right because they don't as they stand now they don't make sense so just do what connor just did and compose things in the opposite order okay And then here, so I have a composition, so I do that in the opposite order. And this is not really binding anything anymore, right? Because it's saying, right, so I have to change the type here as well because I'm flipping all my arrows. Mm. So if I have something like this that makes me next, then I can lift it to this, and this is usually called extend. Okay, so now I can try and see if it loads. Mm, I guess I should change these names as well. <laughs> yes. Um. Thank goodness, duplicate, duplicate stage. Part. Right, yeah. So take this and put it in front. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so it type checks. <laughs> And we have this new new notion of a monad in the opposite category. And we can now think about what, what this actually means, right? So it's definitely not the same as a monad in the original category, because everything is now really going in the opposite direction. And we have this data, the extract and the duplicate. And they have genuinely different types compared to what the return and the, and the join had for a monad. Um, we have this extend, which also looks different. And we can think about what would it mean to be a Kleislimorphism for one of these, right? This is what's called a co Kleislimorphism. So for a monad, we had, we said that a f from x to m of y was like a function from x to y with some extra effects in m, right? Yeah. So M here is saying there's more things you're allowed to do. So that's what monad M. And here, if we are flipping things around, then we would expect this to be something from V of X to Y, right? For a flow monad W. So we are not producing any extra effects. We're not launching any missiles in the end or something like this. But we have maybe a little bit more context on our input, right? So, so we're says, not, not just getting an X, but we are getting a W of X. Yeah, so this says you can do more to obtain the output, and this says you can see more than the input. So this is e extra stuff that's available for you to look at uh, on the input side, rather than extra stuff that's available for you to do on the output side. Right. Um, so let's see if this is actually useful for anything, right? Uh, do you want to do this one again, maybe? Uh, I could do this one. Um, OK. So like I said, this is this notion of, um, we defined it, we can call it again. Uh, yes. Being able to, uh, to see more, um, oh, you're, um, so, uh, I've got to give, um, first of all, to say what type constructor this is going to be. So the idea is that it represents a notion of 
knowing some extra stuff, and the extra stuff we know is called X. E, uh, right. Sorry? E. Um, So okay. I'm giving us okay, you give me an E. Parameter. The parameter is E. This is yeah. the this is E for environment. Yeah. And then I have to say, what is it uh, to have the environment information around as the, well as uh, X? Was that the right move? Yeah, that's what I had in mind. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, it's the simplest way of adding some. Uh, some extra contextual information around a value, you just pair it up with the extra stuff. Uh, so you could imagine that this E is the configuration data for the database or the username of the user or your favorite color or whatever yeah. it is, right? And you... Okay, so I have to make a functor. Uh, what does it do on objects? Well, the objects are types. It does exactly the thing we just wrote down. Um, and I have to say uh, what it does on uh, morphisms. So someone's going to give me a function from x to y. But instead of getting just an x, I'm going to get a pair of an e and an x. And uh, by the fact that there's only one fish in the barrel, uh, there's, uh, there's nothing to be done except to keep the environment information around and do the function to the actual value. OK. I'm hoping that, um, yes, uh, I hoping that turns out to be reflexivity and I'm hoping that this also turns out to be reflexivity so that was cheap do you want to take over okay do. do you want me to right. do you want to do the code manual as well um well, you do yeah, yeah do it. well okay right so we have a fun a functor from set to set and now what does it mean to actually turn this into a comonad? Well, so we have to we have the functor, it's env. and then we need to define the extract and the duplicate and prove that they satisfy these laws, right? So let's see what this consists of. So extract for every x should go from the functor applied to x and then just back down to x, right? Why, why don't you normalize that? Go fully normalize that. Yeah, uh, yes. It's Same also a bit annoying. Pair of an e and an x. Okay, so extract always asks, what's the value here where I am? Uh, so it just projects. So it throws the rest of the environment away, and. Oh. So. I'm going to be fed up with the goal being written with a sigma type here. So, so you are, I'm just you've going got to find my a own constrictor. <laughs> constrictor times and fields. First is in A, second is in B. Is it allowed to say fields? No, is it just a field? Yes. Yeah. And you okay. need to say that it's a set. And uh, that's a set. And I need to stop importing. Perfect. Yeah. Right. So now we can see what's going on. So we see that extract needs to take an environment app value, so an e and an x, and give me an x. Right. Well, that's what the second production is doing. Oh, I should open this. Yeah. Okay, and <coughs> is this natural? So given an f from x to y, you have to show that mapping and then taking the second projection is the same thing as doing it the other way around. So 
since raffle works, we don't have to think too much about it. Right. Okay, what about duplicate? So this has to be a natural transformation from one application of env to env composed with env. Okay, to transform it. It says for every x. Well, we have to go from e times x to e times e times x. So, so yeah, so the meaning of duplicate is always to decorate all the values that are stored in the data structure locally with their context. So in that case, our x gets paired up with its own private copy of, of e. Yeah, so we're saying, okay, the environment stays the same. And then here, I now have to give an env of x, which is another e times x. So I store the local copy, which is all of this in this case. Right. Give me an extra bracket. And that's also the only thing I can do, right? I need to put an E here, I need to put an E here. I only have one E around, so I better use that one. Okay, is this natural? Looks good to me. Looks good to me too. Okay, and then does it satisfy the laws? Right. Well, that also looks okay, right? So it's the same kind of lambda, and then here we just have x, and here we have the two components of x, but we have this eta equality. It says that that's just equal. Same thing here, and same thing here, but more complicated, it seems. Okay, so the proofs are really cheap in this case because everything around had lots of nice eta equalities. But, um, Right, so just like some monads have special morphisms into them, right? This co-monad has a special morphism out of it, which is extracting the environment value, uh, which I mean, you could maybe call ask. And there's nothing special about this, right? It's just saying if you have an E and an X, you can look at the E. <laughs> But that means that if you actually were to program with this, you could use this as a kind of abstract interface where you can yeah. use the extend to compose things together. And then when you want to know what the database password is or whatever it is, you use ask to, to get it right. So uh, yeah, so comonads capture interesting ways of seeing. And this is the, the least completely non no, you're not completely boring comonad. But you see, if, if you think of this as an X with some extra information, then this says whenever you want, you can get an E, right? Whenever you want, you can get the configuration data. And that's different from just programming with, with X, just things without an environment. Uh, okay, do you want to do a slightly more interesting example? Yeah. Oh, I dropped in it, am I? Uh, right. So we can go on. Can tell. Oh yes, that's a good move. We can tell we're not going to be able to make a list comonad because we don't know how to extract stuff from nil. Right? We're not going to be able to get uh, something from nothing. Um, but uh, a fine example of a comonad uh, is um, is a non-empty list. So comonads often have a flavor of uh, a data structure with a cursor in it that you can move. This is an example of that. So let's see, what do I have to do? Uh, I don't know what's in the library, which could make this difficult. Yeah, but... right. So I, I had in mind, so there is in the standard library, uh, there is a data type of non-empty lists. So that's what I would recommend to use here. Yes, which... And it's called list plus, but yeah. not so much shouting. So I have to say what it does. So it's called list plus. So is this list... And then backslash, backslash at 
plus. Yeah. Plus, like that. And if you give that, we can look at what it is. No, oh, uh, doing that favorite thing again. How do I? If you middle click on that. What's middle click? <laughs> right. So here we can see so this is from the standard library. So we see that a non-empty list is a record. It has a constructor which has the same kind of cons name. But that's a single character? Uh, yeah, yes, like a list. Um, that's the same. Um, and it has a head which is an element and then the tail is an ordinary list. Yeah. So we are making sure there is non-empty by ins ensuring that we always have a head and then the tail could be non-empty or not. We don't particularly care. Right. Okay. So, um, what have we got? Uh, so someone's going to give us a function from elements to elements. And I'm going to avoid typing any Unicode by doing a mechanical case split. And then it chooses dreadful names. Well, I'll choose better names. So, so far, so completely unsurprising. Um, uh, let me see. Um, ha! <laughs> that's amusing. Um, it's too stupid to figure out. Is there a thing called list already? Yes. Ah, uh, but it's not. It's not qualified, so that's why it doesn't see it. Uh huh. So I certainly want to give f of x. Is it backslash double colon? Yeah. Something. And then what's map for lists? List dot map. List dot map or dot f map. Dot map. Good. Right, and now. There are some uh, boring proof obligations. Yeah, so maybe we we'll leave these in the interest of time. Yes. Uh, I mean, they can't not be true. Maybe we do it like can, this. Actually, but you want <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, yeah. Steal these. All right, because we want to get to the interesting bit. Um, uh, which is which is this? I think you can take a look. Yeah, so there are actually lots of choices for how to do this, but there's one in particular that I know Fred has in mind. I can tell because of the example. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Uh, here I've got to give my functor, and that's uh, shouty list plus. Okay. So, um, first of all, we've got to decide uh, uh, what the extractor is. So, for all x, someone's going to give us an x cons x's. Uh, and we have to give back an x. And, uh, but remember the question that's asked by extract is, what is here? So the notion of here for a non-empty list, here is the beginning of it, the start, the head element. So I could indeed just have said head. Well, maybe I should have. It's fine here. Okay. And, and in general, this is the only thing you can do here, right? Because for all we know, this tail is empty. So if you have an idea of always returning the last element or something like this, then, then you're in trouble right. in general. Uh, so then, um, the notion of moving around in a non-empty list, there is a choice of such uh, 
what it means to move around inside a non inside a data structure, and in particular in this one. But the the choice we are going to make somewhat arbitrarily is that we are allowed to move further down into the non-empty list if that's available, but not back up again. And that determines so that notion of permitted movement determines what the uh, the duplicate has to be. Although first of all, I suppose I better prove the naturality of this thing, which I'm very much hoping is going to be trivial. Right, on we go. Right. So here, someone is giving me the type X and um, right. Having done this very recently, I would recommend to do this in a separate function. Uh, yes, I can see why you would say that. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that the people who wrote the definition of non-empty lists in the Agda library did so in very poor taste. Um, so let's call this function, it's usually called tails. Mm -hmm. So let's roll it. It's not quite so Haskell-like. Um, not quite. And it goes from list. Um, right. What I mean is you have a double colon there. Yes. Uh, yes, OK. Fair. I was just thinking Haskell. Uh, list. Uh, uh, uh. Huh. Um, your smart maneuver somehow missed one of the list classes. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. I've got to produce. Um, oh, whoops. What's going wrong? Lots of things are going wrong. How did I get into overwrite mode? No. And what's more, how do I get out of it? <laughs> uh, definitely in. Can you just click on that to make it go away? Turn off minor mode. Um, right. We'll get there. Right. So the idea of the duplicate is that, as I said earlier, you decorate every value stored in the data structure with its locality. Um, so here, we've got to give back a non-empty list of non-empty lists. Uh, so here, at the, in the head position, we've got to give back uh, a non-empty list instead of just an element. And what's more, we need to make sure that the thing in the head position of this list is the thing that was in the original head position. So. Uh, we've got to give back, um, and then we've got to give it in its context. Okay. Now, did I want to do that? Um, uh, because now I've painted myself into a corner. Okay. I see what I want to do. Um, can I do that with co-patterns? Is that a thing? Uh, I guess you could, yeah. Uh, all right. So let me just keep my ingredients as they were. I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, right. So, yeah. This is one thing I love about co-patterns. So here, my favorite moves. I know what head I want to give back, which is that thing. 
OK. So now I have to give back the tail of mine on empty list. What's that spurious red doing? Because you have some spurious white space at the end. You're now in override mode again for some reason. Because uh, of doing bad things with function key instead of control key. What the hell just happened? How do I make the... <laughs> Let me try. Did I just manage to... No, it's good to me. Okay. I wanted to get rid of that bit of white space. Okay. So we've dealt with how to be where how to be here, you know. I'm here when I'm in, in my when I've got my original element in its original context. So now let's investigate where else we could go. Well, in this case, there's nowhere else we can go. So we're done. Here, there's somewhere else we can go. So what goes there is... Ah, now I'm in trouble. Um... You've done this more recently than me. Is there something in the library that forgets the non-emptiness of the list? Yes, to list. To list. Right, and now I can make a recursive call to tails on y x's. And now, is that the termination checker giving me a bad time? It is an all. Um, okay. That's really annoying. That's annoying, yeah. Um, Does it help to... I didn't do it this way when I prepared this. Does it help to turn on guardians? Um, because... It, it looks like it's structurally recursive, yeah. but for subtle reasons, it isn't quite. Is it? Has it figured it out? Nope. 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 Okay, that's a nine. Um, what way did you do it? Uh, <laughs> right. So I. That's that's the thing that we want, and, it, it, yeah. and it's being paranoid. Right. So this is the nice definition by cool patterns. Right. Uh, so. Okay, and I think I still want to look at X's. And in this case, we want something. Something. So we always want the head to be the whole thing, right? I'm going to call that wise. And in this case, we said we are happy. In this case, we say wise followed by something. And the something I had, I think, was right. So we would like to say. Tales of. Ah, yeah, okay. So, right, now I remember. So I actually wanted to bring this up because you could run into something similar in the coursework. And the problem is that. So it looks like this is smaller than this, right? But. Actually, this is a list. This is, this a, is list. a list. Plus. So this is the construction of a list, <laughs> and this is the construction of the record. Uh, so even though we are going down in this part of the record, we are actually reassembling it. So this argument is not going down. It's just one part of it. So the usual way to fix this is to actually define a, a version of this. Tails prime, and we should do before this one, I suppose. Which works on? Where we just unpack what, what this record is. So this was an X and an ordinary list. Uh, 
and then the tails we can define here if we have an x and an x is packaged up in the record we just define it to be tails prime of x axis and now here we can pattern match on the x like we want so if it's can you do the co-pattern thing uh, so here i guess we could do the co-pattern thing again indeed so so now you want to say the head is always x cons x is. so the head is x cons x is and the tail we look at x's if it's empty then it's empty and if it's y x's then we do a recursive call tails prime y x's y x's and now this argument the tails prime has clearly gone down right yeah. okay so and then we have to do the to list again right but so we need to pop that in its spot um, and then not do any of the proofs because we want to run this program. Um, okay, and now naturality here you would expect to be a little bit more work because this is actually pattern matching on things. Right? Yeah. Um, but already now we can run the duplicate on the list one, two, three, four, five. Let's see what we get if we do that. And, uh, okay, let me force it. Count down equals something and the proof that it equals something is REPL. Pull in solve. Um, did I not fill this out? It's because of my wretched use of co-patterns, right? Uh, yes, it is. Um. <laughs> okay, that's. So the problem is the co-patterns will only compute if you apply head or tails to it, right? So I can say that head of countdown is something. Yes. And the head of head of countdown. Head of tail of countdown. Uh, head of tail of countdown. Except that this is. <laughs> well, well, you can should just be able to say tail of countdown. And then you will at least get something. Uh, you'll see something, but not a lot. Yes, that's better. The tail of it does work out. Right. And you can see that in the position where two was before, we've got two with its, with its original uh, neighbours. So, that, yeah, this is saying, well, in the position of two, there's two, but you can get to three, four and five. In the position of three, we still have three, but we note that you can get to four and five. Um, in the position that four was, you've got four but you can get to five and in the position of five there's five but you can't go anywhere so every um uh, uh every element has been decorated with its sublist and you might think this is far too late now but yes. this is actually a lot like the focus function in the first coursework right where you you put in but then you could go both ways Yes. And we had this notion of the cellular automaton with the, the context of the cellular automaton was the neighbors. And that's exactly a commonadic thing like this, right? Saying I, I am in this position, I can see my neighbors. So that could be a nice way to write the cellular automaton, just structure it as a commonad like this. But okay, it's well time we stopped. Yes. Uh, so that was the last lecture. Um, there's still labs to this week, no labs next week and labs on Wednesday and Thursday in week 12. And then the deadline is in week 12, unless you tell me you, you don't want it to be in week 12, in which case we can negotiate it. Okay.